starring Basil Rathbone in an original radio play, A Continental Uniform, on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont. Our play tonight is a story of a great American patriot and hero who, through personal grievances and frustrations, came to gather the seeds of his own corruption along the way. And finally, because there could be no turning back on the devious road he had traveled alone, reaped the bitter harvest of his treason. It is the story of Benedict Arnold. Our play is written by Robert Tallman. Basil Rathbone appears in it by courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, in whose production, The Man from Martinique, he will soon be seen. On the Cavalcade of America, DuPont presents A Continental Uniform, starring Basil Rathbone. traitor is best remembered not for how he lived, but for how he finally died. That's why we commence our story not at the beginning, but somewhere near the end. This is England, the last year of the 18th century, Westminster Abbey. It looks much the same as it did a few years ago, but there's a monument that's somewhat new, for it says, sacred to the memory of John Andre, who fell a sacrifice to his zeal for king and country, October 2nd, 1780. Before it stand a man and woman, aged beyond their years. They're Benedict Arnold and his wife, Peggy. John Andre. Think of it, Peggy. A man has to be dead to have a shrine in Westminster Abbey. Yet Andre is more alive than I am. You mustn't torture yourself this way, Benedict. What's done is done. You mustn't come here anymore. Hmm. I mustn't come here anymore. I must wear my scarf. I must take the physic the doctor left. Shh, Benedict. What have I become, a doddering old fool, to be told what I mustn't do by a wife who's much too young and handsome to be anything but a nursemaid to my old age? Benedict, please, don't raise your voice. Remember where we are. Sorry. I mustn't rouse the dead, must I? I can feel Andre's spirit rising now to take you in his arms, to take you away from me. I knew what I was doing when I married you instead of John Andre, Benedict. Did you? Then we're both mad. Why do you say that? Because Andre died a martyr? You might have died the same? You took the same chances? No, no. Andre took his chances for a loyalty he can thank God he died with. I took mine for revenge and 30 pieces of silver. There's a high and dangerous business for a general in a mighty cause. God help me, Peggy. I'm sick. I'm sick. Come. It's damp and chilly here. You know how the damp brings back the pain in your leg. Then I'll stay. That pain is my only reminder that I once had honorable wounds. <laughs> Portrait of a traitor. How did he come here to stand with festering conscience among the illustrious dead of a foreign land? Come, let us go to another place in time, leave off our wondering, and see him for a moment as he was. Patriot, hero, not yet for sale to the highest bidder. A military hospital at Albany, the second year of the war for independence. A surgeon bends over Benedict Arnold. No, no, no. I will not allow you to re-split my leg. If the leg refuses to mend, I'll have it cut off. I'm losing something more precious than a leg lying here inactive. Oh, come now, you exaggerate, General. Exaggerate? Have you seen this newspaper? Six officers cited by the Congress for promotion. Rewarded with important posts, and every man of them inferior to me. I am passed over, completely neglected. Well, why not send a letter to the Congress? Letters. I've sent them letters. They care nothing for victories. They want to know how much money it's costing. You can't be a general and keep books at the same time. Don't they realize that? Perhaps in time, they will. Time. Time is our greatest enemy. And the Congress can use more of it than anybody. Scoundrels. Little they care for independence when it comes to paying for it. 
And yet they're all the Congress we've got, General Arnold. I thank God we've any Congress at all. Oh, yes, yes, I suppose you're right. And yet... Yes, Jen? If I had the choice to make, I'd hang every mother son of them. What? You think that treason? Are we to be ruled by a set of petty and myopic bookkeepers? Better treason than that. Better treason? Well, I've had my share of humiliation at their hands. Yes, I've had my share. But I'm fighting still. And God willing, I'll fight to the end in the service of my country. <laughs> General Washington, General Benedict Arnold. At your service, General Washington. It's a pleasure to see you on your feet again, General Arnold. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be on them, especially when they bring me to your quarters. Uh, that reminds me, General Arnold. I have your application for a new commission, but I just now discovered a complication. Apparently, you wanted to resign your commission before you were wounded. That's right, sir, I did. But why? Uh, well, uh, if you don't mind, sir, I'd rather not discuss it. Believe me, uh, it was a matter of honor. I had personal differences with General Gates. Were you perhaps a little hasty in your judgment of Gates? General Washington, don't you know it's a matter of gossip in your official family that General Gates is in a conspiracy to have yourself removed from command and have himself placed in your boots? I make it my policy never to take notice of any rumors, General Arnold, of any kind. Hmm. By that, sir, you mean rumors concerning me? You'll find me most outspoken in what I mean, General Arnold. I believe there is some justice in your contention that your services have not been properly rewarded. Therefore, I am offering you a commission to command the Continental Troops in Philadelphia. That is, uh, if that leg of yours will permit. General Washington, you have no need to worry about my leg. In a few months, I'll be throwing away this cane. And in six months, why, in six months, sir, I'll be dancing in Philadelphia. <laughs> You are listening to Basil Rathbone in an original radio play, A Continental Uniform, on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. This is the portrait of a traitor. The likeness is not altered appreciably in six months' time. A man of medium height, a little too fond of eating, perhaps. But the bearing is military. He's a great favorite with the ladies, or so it seems. Come, let us look at him now. On the crest of the wave, General Benedict Arnold, commander of Philadelphia, the fourth year of the War for Independence. He's dancing with a lovely lady. Peggy Shippen. She smiles upon him. General Arnold, you mustn't hold my hand so tightly. People will notice. I want them to notice. If you don't watch out, I shall kiss you right here and now, and then we shall have to be engaged. Please. Let's go out on the balcony, shall we? I am at your service, Miss Shippen. Ah, the air's better here, isn't it? Miss Shippen. Yes? Peggy. What is it, Benedict? I, uh... I hesitate to speak for one so far above me as yourself, being a, a widower of uncertain military fortunes, and uh, you, uh, well, a young girl, waiting mayhap for a fresher, younger love. I gave you credit for understanding me better than you do, sir. If you believe that I'm pining for the absent Major Andre, you're mistaken. He came here a man, an officer in a brave, determined army. Then the rebels retook our city. Peggy? The Continentals, then, if you like that better. But you are rebels against the king, aren't you? That's not the question. Oh, but it is very much the question. Oh, Peggy, you leave me with scarcely anything to say. Then don't say anything. Just take me in your arms. Peggy. Oh, my darling, my precious. If you only knew how I've longed for you ever since the moment I met you. Father will be furious, you know. He doesn't think much of soldiers' pay. <laughs> But I'll be a man of property after the war is over. If our side wins, that is. And it will win, God willing. You believe their promises? I believe in General Washington. General Washington, yes. But what of the Congress? Oh, bother the Congress. Will you marry me, Peggy? Perhaps. 
You don't understand me very well as yet, my dear. But you will. I feel certain you will. Well, well, General Arnold, my congratulations. Philadelphia held a greater conquest for you than I suspected it would. My congratulations, now, Thank sir. you, General Washington. Uh, you'll excuse me if I come straight to the point. It's about these newspapers that are printing these dreadful stories, slanders about my wife and myself. I told you once, General Arnold, that I never put stock in rumors. But the public does, General Washington. What am I to do? I'm charged with lining my own pockets under the guise of suppressing profiteers, with favoring Tories, with every conceivable evil a man could, could be charged with. These charges aren't true, are they, General Arnold? General Washington, on my honor as a man and a soldier, there is not one word of truth in them. Then demand a court-martial. Court-martial? The offensive, my boy. Your own tactics. Have you forgotten Saratoga so soon? Ah, there's a point. Challenge them to produce proof of the charges. General Washington, God bless you. You've saved my bacon again. And you'd have done as much for me, I know. Of all my official family, Arnold... I have admired you most, save one, and that is General Lafayette, whom I have regarded as my own son. Mrs. Arnold? Oh, Captain Pell. Mrs. Arnold, the trial is over. General Arnold is coming directly, madam. Yes, I see him. He's coming now. Uh, please go, Captain. Thank you. Good day, Mrs. Arnold. Driver! Driver! Yes, sir. Drive us home. Yes, sir. Right, get him! Yes. Barking dogs. Pinheaded blunderers. Convict me of hauling groceries in public wagons, eh? Darling, don't mind. Reprimand from General Washington. Stinking skunks! Trying to cover up their putrid stench that way, black-hearted vultures, Anything. stupid long-nosed curs, nuzzling for rat holes. Civil authority, eh? Rotten political scoundrelism. You mustn't feel that way about it. They'll be sorry. Every one of them. They'll regret this to their dying day. What happens to a man when his mind is made up? When he decides to betray his inmost loyalty? Does his face change? No, it must not. It's the mask against the guilty secret. If he's Benedict Arnold, he develops patience, cunning. He no longer demands, he asks coolly, reasonably for what he wants. His face is a miracle of stolidity when his friend expresses surprise. Arnold, I, I don't understand this request. West Point, there's nothing to do there. I've always thought of you as a man of action. West Point is a vital post, General Washington. If we lose it, we'd be cut in two. Yes, it's important, but we couldn't possibly lose it. Haven't I been crucified enough? At any rate, sir, give me command of the post at West Point, at least until my wound is healed. Very well, Arnold. I don't understand it, but if West Point's what you want, you can have it. West Point. There's an odd choice of temple for the kiss of treason. A bleak barracks on the Hudson. Who would have dreamed it might be important someday? Who but a great general? Who but Benedict Arnold? He's making it important. He's putting West Point on the map. The lamp burns late in General Arnold's study. Hmm? Oh, yes, Piggy? I'll be along in a moment. Can't you sleep? It's so quiet. It's so deadly quiet in this place. Well, we shan't be here much longer. You're writing the letter to them? Yes, the last one. This is my fault. I shouldn't have let you begin this. Peggy, you have nothing to do with what I have done or will do in this business. Remember that. Never forget it. I could see everything clearly before you wrote that last letter. Why did you have to tell them where General Washington was crossing the river? He was your friend. He might have been killed or captured. He was my only friend. That's why I had to do it. Don't you understand? A friend. 
can hurt more than an enemy. And when you make an enemy your friend? We shall see. I told you this was the last letter, Peggy. I'm offering West Point to the British for 20,000 pounds. Andre? At your service, sir. Oh. You know what we're to do? I have my orders, sir. Have I Sir Henry's word that he agrees to my terms? We will pay your price. Twenty thousand pounds for the surrender of West Point. Half that if we fail. Good. Tonight I'll take you to a friend's house, Major Andre. We can talk better there. I had no orders to go inside American lines. You have nothing to fear. You must take my word for it. Your word? Uh, I mean... I'll give you a pass in the name of John Anderson. Here is my part of the bargain. The plans of West Point. Here, come on, take them. My orders were not to accept any papers, General Arnold. I'm afraid you have no choice, Major Andre. Very well, sir. I will take the papers. Don't forget. Your name is John Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't know when I've laughed so heartily at breakfast. Uh, Colonel Hamilton, I'm tempted to match your excellent stories with one of my own. Ah, let's hear it, General Arnold. Well, well, I knew a Connecticut farmer once who was walking along a rope. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen. What is it, Major? This report just came. A suspicious character has been captured down the river. His name is John Anderson. Anderson? Well, uh... Are there any, any papers on him? Yes, of a most incriminating nature, sir. They've been sent to General Washington. Washington? You don't think the matter, General? No, 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 no. It's a, it's a routine, routine matter. Um, Major, keep me, keep me posted. Uh, well, where was I? Uh, you were telling the story of the farmer, General. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Yes, I was. Uh, well, this, uh, this farmer... Walking down the road, he met one of his field hands, you see, and he said, uh, Look at that beautiful sky. There's nothing more beautiful than the setting sun. And the field hand said, uh, That ain't no setting sun. That's your home burning down. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me a moment, gentlemen. I must speak to my wife. Major. Yes, sir. Please order my horse unstabled. I have an errand at once. I'll take care of it, General Arthur. Orderly. Send a Yes? Peggy, I must speak to you. Of course, dear. Oh, what is it? Andre has been captured. No. Oh, no, I don't believe Stop it. Stop it, Peggy. Pull oh, yourself together. I can't. I won't believe it. I failed, Peggy. You must face it. Oh, we must do something. You must do something. You're too clever to be caught. You, you must talk your way back into favor, as you have so many times yes, before. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe I could at that. I could say I contacted the enemy for purposes of... Finding out their spies. Yes. Who is it? Collins, sir. Oh, well, uh, come in, come in. Pardon, sir. Beg to report, sir. General Washington has been reported two miles over in Connecticut on his way here. Shall we send a detail to escort him? Yes. Oh, of course. Uh, take care of it, will you, Major? Yes, sir. Benedict, luck is on your side again. General Washington is your friend. No, no, I can't face him. I'd stay and face anyone else but not him. You leave me to face him? I must, for both our sakes. For the child, too. Oh, but what will I do? What, what will I say? That's I... why you know nothing. Have hysterics. Do anything. Faint. But I can't stay here and face Washington. Goodbye, my darling. Oh, where will I come I don't to know. You? I don't know. Only come. Come when I tell you. I'll need you desperately. <laughs> Don't be sad, darling. Think, this boat is carrying us to a, a new life in England. New life? Does anybody ever have a new life? Darling, don't think of the past. You've served the king. In London, you'll be a hero. A hero? Look, Peggy, 
America is growing smaller and smaller. Look at it, Peggy. Look at it as long as you can. We may never see it again. Your Royal Highness, I have come to offer my services to my country. Your country? Which country do you mean now, Mr. Arnold? I, uh, I've heard of the, of the coalition. England and France will soon be at war. I am ready to accept any sort of command. You have forced this interview, I will be frank. What you ask is impossible. Impossible, Your Highness? Uh, Mr. Arnold, no British officer would serve with you. Excuse me, sir. Have I uh, permission to sit at your table? Oh, please. Be seated, sir. Be seated. And delighted to talk to somebody. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, this English nation. What food and weather. One sauce, one weather. Both miserable. <laughs> and on top of it, I must go to America. America? At one time, I lived in America. Oh, what fortune, sir. I am the Count Maurice de Talleyrand. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Count Talleyrand. Uh, perhaps you will be so kind as to give me an introduction to some of your friends and countrymen, eh? Count Talleyrand, I'm the only American in the world who cannot give you letters to any man in his own country. I am Benedict Arnold. <laughs> Portrait of a traitor, old and hunched now, dying now in a lonely room in a foreign city. He looks up into the face of the woman who leans over him, his wife. The most beautiful woman in America has been his wife. Her lips are moving, but only a few words reach his ears. Darling, try to rest. Peggy. Yes, dear? All I've left. Peggy. This is the end. It's over. And I'm glad it is now. No, no. Don't say it, darling. What have I ever offered you all these years? Shame. Disgrace. Now there's nothing left. Peggy. Yes, darling? Bring me my continental uniform. You... And... Bring me the epaulets and sword knots General Washington gave me. Yes, darling? I will. I want to die in my old uniform, Peggy. May God forgive me for putting on any other. Thank you, Basil Rathbone. And now another story of chemistry this time. Gain Whitman tells how cellophane has enlisted for the duration to help assure our nation of victory. Cellophane is helping in the war efforts on two fronts, not only with the armed forces, but behind the lines, doing a conservation job. Light and thin, but strong, cellophane offers greater protection for a pound of material used than other packaging materials. The saving in weight and bulk is vital in wartime. Because they are light and compact, Cellophane packages save transportation. Coal, oil, rubber, gasoline, trucks, all must be conserved. Every pound hauled by rail or truck demands its toll in fuel and wear. Every inch of shipping space is precious. Here are some examples of cellophane helping to conserve. Figures tell the story. 
For instance, packaging a thousand pounds of puffed cereal in cellophane takes only a tenth as much material. Or when you're packaging rice, cellophane cuts the amount of material you need right in half. Another example, milk bottles. When you use cellophane hoods to protect bottled milk and cream, you cut the amount of protective material you need by nearly 70%. Quick frozen foods are a conservation measure in themselves, and cellophane gives them a plus factor. To can a million pounds of peas, for example, takes more than 200,000 pounds of metal and thousands of pounds of shipping cases. To package the same amount of quick frozen peas takes no metal at all, just cartons, waxed paper, and cellophane. And you can ship a million pounds of quick frozen peas in cellophane in 31 freight cars as against 64 for canned peas. Then, too, cellophane is being used to add moisture proofness and grease proofness to paperboard containers to permit their broader use and save precious metal. On some products, the metal body of a container is being replaced with paperboard laminated with cellophane, saving 70% to 80% of the metal. Cellophane is used for a good many purposes by our armed forces in packaging bandages, compresses, surgical dressings, and drugs for the Army and Navy, for instance. Not only because of its sanitary and moisture-proof qualities, but because it's an effective wrapping to keep out poison gas. Hospitals use it for surgical masks. Surgeons rely on the film as a cover for wet dressing. And the Army uses cellophane in packaging some of the balanced emergency rations that have taken the place of the hard tack and corned willy of the First World War. In airplane plants, cellophane speeds the job of assembling planes, although we can't tell you how until the war is over. Maps and charts are surfaced with cellophane to keep them free of grease and dirt and shield them against the weather. And delicate instruments and precision tools used in the war industries are shipped in cellophane to cut down the chances of corrosion. These are a few of the points in America's war effort at which DuPont cellophane is handling important jobs doing its part to safeguard our democracy, for which in time of peace, DuPont works to produce better things for better living through chemistry. Next Monday on the Cavalcade of America, DuPont will present another play with a stirring and vital message for men and women of our time. Its title, In This Crisis, the star, Claude Rains. Don't forget, next Monday night at the same time, Claude Rains in In This Crisis. The musical score for tonight's program was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. This is John Heaston sending best wishes from DuPont. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>